Hey guys, welcome to Hip Hughes History. We're hitting you up with the presidential election of 1816 as we watch our boy James Monroe from the great state of Virginia ascend to another two-term presidency for the Democratic Republicans. So let's take a look at any opposition that he had. What were the campaign issues of the time? Of course, the electoral results. I'll say it now. Giddy up for the learning, guys. Let's go get her done right now. So first, let's take a look at the Democratic Republicans. Now, James Monroe um, has a long political history, governor of Virginia, he was an ambassador to France, secretary of war, secretary of state. So his resume is pretty impressive. And he has the blessings of James Madison, the current president, and good old Thomas Jefferson still hanging around in 1816. And he gives his blessings to James Monroe as well. But there is a little trepidatiousness about having another Virginian in the presidency. Remember, Washington's a Virginian. Now, John Adams was from Massachusetts. Massachusetts, that's a one-termer, but then we have Thomas Jefferson with two terms, and of course James Madison from Virginia as well. So there are a lot of Southern Democratic Republicans who don't see this as a great thing. So the competition comes from one William Crawford from Georgia. Now William Crawford was the Secretary of War for James Madison. He then became the Secretary of Treasury, and he really didn't want to rock the boat. He didn't really announce his candidacy. He didn't run. He didn't want to lose favor with James Monroe. He liked being being Secretary of Treasury, to be honest with you. But back then, these presidential nominees were really nominated in congressional caucuses. So it is pretty stiff competition for James Monroe. He ends up eking out a win, 65 to 54, but that does show you that there is at least some opposition from the southern part of the United States for someone else uh, occupying the White House. But other than that, that's pretty much it. James Monroe now has the nod. For his vice president, he chooses Daniel. Neil Thompson from the great state of New York, really at the bequest of Martin Van Buren and the political machinery of New York. They want to make sure that they have some influence in this White House as well. Now, the Federalists, that's a whole different story. The Federalists really don't nominate a candidate. They have their own problems that's really stemming from the Hartford Convention. The Hartford Convention held in 1814 was a gathering of Northern Federalists really to plan their opposition to the War of 1814. And although there were radicals there that even talked about secession, and that's kind of a treasonous thing to say, most of the Hartford Convention was run by moderates, but there were plans to make secret treaty negotiations with Great Britain in the midst of a war. And now that that war is over, the Treaty of Ghent has been signed. Andrew Jackson and his famous New Orleans bout is going to really pump up American nationalism. The Federalists look just plain old stupid silly. So the Federalists don't even have a caucus in Congress to nominate anybody. They end up putting Rufus King on the ticket. He ran as vice president for a few times as a Federalist. He's from New York, but he knows he's going to lose. Everybody knows he's going to lose. All right, guys, let's take a look at the issues that are surrounding the campaign, and we'll look at what those elections are. <laughs> In terms of political issues, this is really the beginning of the era of good feelings, where we're really going to one party rule in the United States. I think that James Madison figured out that by kind of inching towards some popular Federalist positions that he thought were good for the country, that he really could eliminate the Federalists as competition politically. And those two issues would be the passing of the Second National Bank of the United States and James Madison really wrapping his arms around protective tariffs. These are two issues, a strong sense of economic economic nationalism with the National Bank and a strong protective tariff to protect manufacturers is really going to take issues away from the Federalists and really secure the Democratic Republicans as really the only serious political party in the United States. And I'll mention it again, you can't say it enough, the Hartford Convention is the dagger that's going to create the death of the Federalist Party. They're really not going to have a serious Federalist run for the presidency anymore. So Rufus King, he's just going to wear the sign around his neck. Now we're going to see him get pummeled electorally. <laughs> One eighty-three to thirty-four. It's an electoral wipeout. 
There are 19 states. James Monroe is going to win 16 of those 19. We only see Delaware, Massachusetts, and Connecticut still voting for the Federalist, and Rufus King really isn't even running. The popular vote is even worse. Now, there's only seven states that have a popular vote, but James Madison's going to win that popular vote 68% to 31%. So this is a wrap-up for the Federalist Party. We're going to see in a moment this error of good feelings really eliminate them from any type of serious competition in a presidential election. And we now we have another Virginian in the White House. All right, guys, giddy up for the learning. We hope that you understand something about the election of 1816, the beginning of the error of good feelings, the end of the Federalist Party, and a brighter tomorrow. Maybe, maybe not. All right, guys, where attention goes, energy flows. We'll see you guys next time that you press my buttons.